Today, if we're seriously ill, we expect to be treated in high-tech hospitals with sophisticated surgery. But in the past, surgeons didn't work in hospitals and surgery was rarely used to cure disease. When did things change? Surgery has existed for thousands of years, but in the past, it was usually only used in emergencies. Generally, surgeons only carried out certain types of operations, most of which had been on the surface of the body, cutting off diseased parts of the body and drilling holes in the skull to relieve pressure. Bleeding was the most common surgical procedure. Some people liked to be bled regularly because they thought it was good for them but almost any other surgical procedure was likely to end in death. So doctors avoided surgery. Generally, they tried to treat the whole body by prescribing medicines, diet and exercise to get it back into balance. They did this because they thought disease was part of the whole way you lived your life. What you ate, where you lived, what work you did and what kind of person you were. This kind of medicine continued right up until the 19th century. But by 1840, this way of thinking about illness became less important. Surgery began to take over. It was seen as the best answer for many medical problems. The surgical point of view was that illness was not about the whole body, it was just about specific bits. If you had a lump or a growth, it was because there was something wrong with that particular part. The way to treat it was to remove it. You didn't need to look at the whole person, you just needed to remove the problem. In the 19th century, the sources show us that people were beginning to choose surgery rather than drugs or herbal medicines. This is the case of one of those people, a young working class woman referred to, in her notes, as Elizabeth P. When I was nine years old, I fell and cut my knee, and it became infected. It became so bad they feared it would spread. They must cut it off. Cut my leg off above the knee. So they, they held me down, and my father had his hand tight on my mouth, and the surgeon took his saw. And I remember the feel of the saw. The air on the open flesh like sharp, sharp forks and how the flesh snagged on the saw. And how surgeon tired, mopped his brow and swapped saw from one hand to the other and then began his work again. That was 14 years past. The wound never healed. I cannot remember a time I've not felt pain in this stump. Like pins. And it's disgusting. It's grown a mass. A knot of skin, white like bone, but covered in fungus, which when you touch it is, is very tender and oozes, and it hurts. And so though I know what it is I ask for, I want them to take off what's left of my leg. Elizabeth's case is important for two reasons. First, because she chose surgery, though she didn't have to. Her illness wasn't life-threatening. Second, because she was poor. Surgeons were treating more and more working-class people. They've been very kind at the hospital. My consultant is Mr. William Sands Cox. He's a gentleman. When he examines me, I do not feel any shame. For two years, he's prescribed other treatments. Dilute nitric acid, nitrate of silver, iodine, nothing. We discussed it. He said, have you asked your friends and your family? I said, they're for it. 
He said, there will be pain. I said, I know pain. He said, will you take a drink? I said, I do not drink. When time comes, I will sing hymns and the Lord will be with me. There were no anaesthetics at this time, so the operation was performed with Elizabeth fully conscious on November the 1st, 1844. In the medical newspaper, The Lancet, William Sands Cox described its progress. At half past 11 a.m., the point of a narrow double-edged knife 12 inches in length was introduced at an inch below the anterior superior spinous process of the ilium and carried across the neck of the femur parallel with and a little below the poop-part ligament beneath the muscles of the anterior region of the thigh. In fact, it takes longer to describe the operation than it did to perform it. The operation was completed in under 35 seconds. All the blood vessels were secured in under five minutes and no more than four ounces of blood were lost. Three months later, the wound healed. Elizabeth was at last discharged from hospital. The operation Elizabeth had would not have been done 50 years before. It was possible now because of the increased skills of the surgeons. Before the 19th century, surgery is seen as a savage procedure. In the 19th century, we see many more images like this, showing surgeons as gentlemen. By 1845, surgeons were very skilled and very confident. Part of the reason for this was the Industrial Revolution, which meant that for the first time, there were much greater numbers of poor people living in the big cities. In the past, people like these had lived in the countryside and relied on magical cures, herbal medicine and wise women. They'd not usually been treated by doctors or surgeons. Now, there were many more opportunities for surgeons to practice and to get jobs in hospitals like this one, set up with charitable donations for poor working class people. It meant more jobs for surgeons, but because these patients were poor, the surgeons were more powerful and could experiment. This helped them to become more important in the medical profession. The Industrial Revolution also meant better instruments and new ways of working for the surgeons. For thousands of years, surgical instruments had stayed the same. The kind of instruments used by the ancient Romans would be recognised by any surgeon even today. But in the 19th and 20th centuries, surgeons created many new devices that helped them to carry out very dramatic new operations. 1816, the stethoscope. 1870, the steam carbolic spray. 1895, x-rays. They could now begin to go deep into the body, developing anaesthetics to lessen the pain of operations, antiseptics to keep the wounds clean, and methods of preventing blood loss to stop the body going into shock. By 1922, Harvey Cushing was carrying out successful operations on the brain. He sawed through the skull and used hundreds of clamps to keep blood vessels closed. They were made of steel, so they were sterile. He deliberately used all the methods of working in a sterile environment, using a special room instead of a public hall, using clean clothes for all the doctors and nurses. He even insisted on no unnecessary talking in the operating theatre, as he believed it spread germs. This film was made in 1931. By this time, Cushing was carrying out his 2,000th brain operation. The operations often lasted many hours as the after-effects of deep ether anaesthesia over such a long period could be severe, Cushing worked with a local anaesthetic with just enough ether to keep the patient unaware of what was going on. This rise in the ability of the surgeons was very closely linked to the rise of hospitals. Medicine was moving out of the home. More and more of it took place in the big hospitals in the cities. 
By 1922, hospitals and medical care for ordinary working class people was very well established. The 1911 National Insurance Act meant that far more people got medical treatment. Poor people joined friendly societies and insurance schemes so they could pay for their medicine and there were still charitable donations from rich people. Many hospitals made fundraising films such as this to encourage people to donate money. This reconstruction is based on the hospital records of one of those hospitals, Charing Cross Hospital, for one day in 1922. The drugs available were not very different to the herbal remedies used for thousands of years. The hospital surgeons also still used ancient surgical methods. Leeches were used to bleed patients, sucking out blood to relieve high blood pressure, and cupping was also used putting hot cups on the body to draw out poisons. But more and more people were being treated in the hospitals and surgery was becoming more common. 26 years later, when the National Health Service was set up, the use of surgery as a treatment for ill health became even more widespread. In 1948, medicine became freely available to all. It was paid for out of taxes and national insurance contributions, so that everyone could have health care regardless of how much they earned. I've been asked to tell you just a little about this new plan for better health. Our plan is a service which will provide the best medical advice and treatment for everyone, every man, woman and child in this country. For the first time, high-tech surgery and expensive drugs were freely available to poor patients. They didn't have to rely on charity, as many had in the old hospitals. The evil of disease must be overthrown. The voluntary hospital and the expensive nursing home are not enough to maintain this nation in good health. The finest surgery must be for all. Disease is too deep-rooted for the hurried diagnosis of the ordinary doctor with his few stock medicines. State funds must subsidize research on an adequate scale. The completely free service didn't last. By 1952, just four years later, prescription charges were introduced as the costs of maintaining the service became larger than the government was willing to pay. ...to a shilling per item, but the doctor gets no more. Costs are rising for all of us, for the healthy, for the sick, for the chemist, for the doctor. But the National Health Service still continued to have the belief that ordinary people should have access to the very latest techniques so it supported the rise of surgery. In the 1950s and 60s, vast amounts of money were spent to allow surgeons to pioneer dramatic new operations, such as ways of operating on the heart. The major problem the heart surgeons had to solve was the lack of time they had to do a heart operation. They could anaesthetise the patient, but in order to operate, they had to stop the heart. This meant that the brain would begin to be damaged after four minutes without oxygen pumped round in the blood. They began to solve this problem by cooling down the body. On September 2nd, 1952, a five-year-old girl, Jackie Weeks, with a hole in her heart, was brought in for surgery. Wrapped in a special cooling blanket... Cooling the body had the same effect as when an animal hibernates. Everything slows down. So that gave them the extra time. Five ...without a pumping heart for ten minutes, not four. A girl facing certain early death would now live and grow up to have two children of her own. The doctors who had said it was impossible were proved wrong. That was one solution. A better solution was found when surgeons invented machines to take over the function of the heart. The development of the heart-lung machine was a major step forward. Now surgeons could operate on the heart for much longer, for hours if necessary. Just behind, enabling the patient to be kept perfectly asleep. This made it possible for the first heart transplant to take place in 1967. Working, it's just being warmed up now, being filled. There's the pump and the various other parts of it which you'll see. 
It's going to be filled, of course, with blood from blood donors. Like some have been put in already. By now, it felt like surgeons could do anything. Surgery was now seen as one of the most important parts of medicine, instead of the poor relation it had been for most of history. Because of the rise of surgery, other ways of treating illness became less important. But surgery isn't always the best way to treat illness. One example of this was having your tonsils removed. Surgeons believed that the tonsils were a source of septic infection. You didn't need to have tonsillitis. Perfectly healthy tonsils were often removed just because of this unproved idea that they were somehow unhealthy. It became the most common operation in hospitals. Between the 1930s and the 1960s, every year, 200,000 children in Britain had their tonsils removed. 30 years later, only 65,000 children had the operation. The number of operations went down by 75%. The children hadn't changed that much. What changed was the way illness was treated. Some doctors realised that surgery might not be the best answer. Another example of the surgical attitude to illness was in the treatment of stomach ulcers. They were treated with surgery for over 50 years. It was a very serious operation, as we can see from this film made in 1963. The next step in the operation is to cut across the stomach at a suitable place. And in this case, since we want to remove about two-thirds of the stomach, and no surgeon likes to remove two-thirds of the stomach for an ulcer uh, no bigger than your little fingernail. But at the moment, this is the best operation we have, by and large, for peptic ulcer disease. So far, there was no such thing as a permanent cure for ulcers. Without surgery, the patient had to take tablets for the rest of their lives. In 1984, two doctors, Marshall and Warren, discovered that ulcers were caused by bacteria in the stomach. But nobody believed them, or wanted to believe them. So after a while, you had more and more and more patients taking this expensive medication every single day. Now you can see with so much money rolling in from this treatment, there was not really much incentive for these drug companies who were making that type of treatment to look for a new treatment which would perhaps cure ulcers and not make as much profit. Other surgeons also refused to believe them because all the medical textbooks said that no bacteria could live in the stomach. Over the last century or so, um, nothing had been found growing in the stomach and so no, nobody believed that anything did grow in the stomach and so there have been generations of doctors who have been taught that nothing grows in the stomach. They continued their research. They looked back at medical research from the 19th century and realised that bismuth, commonly used to treat ulcers then, must have been acting as an antibiotic. They began to treat ulcers with antibiotics and proved that many of the radical stomach operations being carried out were unnecessary. They could cure ulcers with a short course of antibiotics. More people were beginning to question surgery and to ask whether there were less drastic solutions. Surgeons themselves also began to look for ways of operating which were less damaging to the body. Surgeons in Liverpool have carried out an operation to remove a tumour from a man's lung using pioneering keyhole surgery. It's the first time in Europe that the technique's been used against cancer and involves making an incision of less than an inch instead of the 12-inch cut needed in conventional surgery. Ramsey Dickens has lung cancer. He had smoked cigarettes from the age of 12 that he gave up 20 years ago. But his tumour is small, so doctors in Liverpool have chosen him to be the first to undergo keyhole surgery for his disease. This could only happen because the ways of seeing inside the body improved dramatically. For most of the 20th century, the only way surgeons could see inside the body was through X-rays. New technologies, such as scans and magnetic resonance imaging machines, meant a much better picture for the surgeons. Within 20 years, we'll be looking back on the 80s and 90s as some form of oddly barbaric times where they used to open patients up.
For a lot of this century, surgery has been seen by many as the most exciting and glamorous part of medicine. Surgeons have operated in big hospitals and developed ever more sophisticated ways of carrying out operations. But will that continue to be the case? Much of what's been done in the health service over the years has been through custom and practice and, and fashion really. Fashion has driven medicine just as it's driven other things. And surgery has been seen to be among the most prestigious specialties. It's attracted people with a particular way of thinking or approach to life. Surgeons who are seen to be miracle workers and uh, heroic individuals who can save lives. There's some uh, thing about medicine being linked to surgery and being linked to operations and the kind of hands-on role of actually tangibly doing something to people, repairing people. And the media, I think, have reflected that in, in programs about healthcare. Healthcare programs certainly generally have been much more about what goes on in hospital, delving around inside people's bodies, than actually about what goes on in the community or what goes on in primary care, which is less visible and less tangible, but arguably maybe, maybe more important. If surgery becomes less important, what will replace it in the medicine of the future? I think uh, medicine's going to change quite radically. I think there's going to be less need for plumbing and, and surgical intervention than there will be for drug treatment, which will change the face of medicine. It'll, it'll change the location of medicine. It'll mean that much less is done in big, high-tech uh, hospital centres, uh, and much more will be done in settings much closer to people's homes and their local community. Uh, so in a sense, we are going back, but we're going back uh, in, in a way that will actually provide much better health care for people in, in local home settings. I mean, the idea of the hospital at home, for example, I think will be a, a novel feature of the, the next century. Another major issue now facing the health service is how to pay for it. There are many current media images about shortages and how health care is rationed. Although people think rationing is a new uh, dilemma for, for the healthcare system, it isn't in fact a new dilemma. It's as old as the, the health service, as old as healthcare generally. I think before the National Health Service, rationing took effect on the basis that people just were denied healthcare, basically. They could get it if they were uh, wealthy or had the, the means to, to pay for it, but there was no healthcare system that was accessible to the whole population. And the health service was about trying to reduce those inequalities and adopt a system of fair access to health care. The cost of medicine has always been affected by how much doctors can do for us. For most of history, most people's medical care has been limited by what they can afford. Today, people continue to argue about the cost of health care. Whatever changes occur in surgery, the discussion will continue about how it should be paid for and how it can be rationed. This unit of programmes is available on video. If you'd like an order form, 